Hello chess fans. Today I'm going to show you one of my favorite Karpov games, A Victory is Black against Jan Timmen, uh, the great Dutch player, one of the greatest players of his generation. This game was played in 1984, early in the year that Karpov would defend his world championship title against Garry Kasparov. This was kind of the apex of Karpov. He was at the height of his powers, he'd been winning everything in sight, and for basically the last decade he'd been the dominant player, and the idea that young Kasparov would give him any trouble in the coming world championship match was, I think, far from anyone's mind. So the game opens with Timon playing pawn e4, and Karpov choosing to meet it classically with pawn e5. Knight f3, knight c6, and we get a scotch game. So we're already on move three, getting something a little different. Maybe this is a new opening for you. This is one uh, opening that Kasparov would later kind of make popular again uh, when he was trying to get around some of the sturdy defenses from black. And players today will still try this, even though I don't know that I think it's very good, <laughs> and I have tried it, uh, try this to get around the Rui Lopez and Berlin defense and stuff like that. So after e takes, knight takes, many beginners might do knight takes d4, and then say after queen takes d4 that white has erred by bringing out the queen too early. In fact, the white queen is strong and powerful here in the center because black lacks natural moves to harass the white queen. If you can't harass the white queen in the center, she's probably good in the center. So instead, Karpov plays knight f6, developing, attacking the pawn on e4, and now we follow a theoretical line. Knight takes c6, pawn takes c6, pawn e5, attacking the knight. Not gonna move the knight right away. Black instead plays queen e7, pinning the pawn. White plays queen e2, unpinning the pawn. Now the knight does need to move. It moves forward to the center with knight d5. Pawn c4, attacking the knight, saying where are you going to go? Bishop a6. For the second time in uh, eight moves to open the game, black chooses to develop and to make a pin rather than to retreat the knight. In fact, though knight b6 is also popular and might even be the better move in this very theoretical position. Here now is I think where Timon makes the first of three mistakes that I'll point to uh, that are eventually going to lose him this game. And I think this uh, early mistake really points to what are going to be his mistakes later on as well. He plays queen e4, kind of a new move, I mean, when you're playing Super Grandmasters, it's important to bring the first new move to the board, but you want it to be a good move. This move neglects further development, continues to leave the king in the center of the board, and I think plays a little bit too much for tactics at the cost of important strategic goals, like I said, development and center. And this is going to be what uh, costs Timon the game later on. So I think this is the first mistake taking Timon down this path that neglects development and king safety and castling. So the queen move does introduce a threat to the knight. Now, Karpov could actually have played more aggressively, and maybe sometimes this would be one of his flaws as he didn't always pick the most aggressive move when he could have. Knight b4 is a good move here because uh, there's threats of knight c2 check and you know ideas for black to go after e5. This is hard to meet. Now, the reason to reject this move might be that the knight has no escape squares. But after a3, a move that tries to uh, tries to punish black for leaving the knight kind of exposed in a position from which it can't retreat, the tactics work out really great for black. Pawn d5, pawn takes, pawn takes. And if you try to do queen takes b4 here, you lose your queen. There's check and an attack on the queen on b4. And if you can't take on b4, you're now struggling to defend knight c2 check and queen takes e5. The only move queen f5 loses either to bishop c8 or pawn g6. You can pick your poison. So instead of going knight b4, which was quite strong, Karpov retreats with knight b6. Knight d2, knight c3 was actually better. Castles, g6 was actually better. And now uh, Timon makes his second mistake. Pawn c5, again, not developing, not thinking about how he's gonna get castled, and choosing tactics over these strategic goals. Black captures on f1, notice that c5 was a very forcing move. There was a threat to the bishop and a threat to the knight, so bishop takes f1 is forced. Now Timon plays his idea, capturing the knight, otherwise he loses the pawn on c5 next turn. Black now retreats the attacked bishop, and white captures this pawn right here. Now the only good, the only good way to stop this pawn from promoting is king b7. This is a good point to stake 
uh, to pause and take stock of the position. In this position, you might go, well, Black's king is exposed and this pawn is strong. But in fact, it's the white king that cannot castle because of the strong influence of this bishop that is in the greater danger. And this position favors black by a fairly significant margin here. So we should pay more attention to the fact that the white king lacks a long-term plan to get safe than the temporary seeming exposure of the black king, which really can't be effectively attacked by white. Now, white picks knight b3, great move. Thinking about knight a5 check, letting this bishop out. Black plays f6, going after the pawn on e5. Now, this pawn on e5 is basically the only defender of the white king, and it's a thin, gauzy, bare defender. I don't think uh, we can count on this pawn to survive for long, and in fact, in the game, it's not going to survive for long. Black is going to focus a lot of the play against this pawn, which, if it goes, will leave the white king very, very exposed. So pawn f6. And now the correct strategy for Timon was to accept kind of strategic defeat and play bishop e3, letting the pawn on e5 go, but trying to get castled or to get the queens off the board after queen b4 check. In both of these cases, black will still be better, but the game will not be over. Instead, Timon makes, I think, the decisive mistake in the game with pawn f4. Uh, stepping up and defending this pawn at the cost, again, of king safety and development. So this is the third mistake, and I think this one is the losing mistake. Pawn takes e5, pawn takes e5, uh, rook e8 going after the pawn and incorporating the rook further into the attack, bishop f4, developing and defending, and queen h4 check. A good check that after g3, queen h5 places the queen on a strong square and leaves white's king more drafty now. Even if he could get castle, which does not seem to be happening, uh, he won't be very safe. Uh, after queen h5, notice that if the queen on e4 moves, there is mate on e2. Now, we're kind of far away from that happening, but we'll see that that's certainly relevant uh, in the game. Timon now plays rook c1, and I've been kind of critical of Timon, who's a great player, uh, and I'm, of course I'm not trying to criticize uh, a legend of chess, but his moves have led him into a lost position uh, by move 19 in this game, and we should acknowledge, you know, what has gone wrong, right? But rook c1 is one of his best moves in the game. And if you're just looking at computer evaluations, you might think, oh, this move's not actually so good. The computer says it's losing. And it is losing, but it creates a lot of dangerous counterplay that players like myself would easily easily allow and could easily uh we could easily lose this position right so this is a good moment i think to pause and think about what moves karpov might have played here uh that would actually allow timon to equalize or even win the game so the first one kind of a blitz blunder is bishop b4 check this is a tempting move in a lot of variations because uh we want to move the queen and then mate on e2 but after queen takes b4 uh, we don't get to mate on e2 because we are in check. This is an idea that is useful to note and will come up later. All right, but let's not uh, look at such an obvious blunder that a world champion would never make. Instead, uh, let's think about some other moves. Uh, king takes a7, certainly natural. Let's eliminate this pawn. This move is another mistake, and after a move like king f2, the black king ends up as exposed as the white king or close to it this is a very complicated game and maybe black is still better but either player could win this game the white king is safer than it was before another move after rook c1 might be pawn d5 attacking the queen and this is also a good move strong move but after queen c2 there's some counterplay against the black king and the game is not yet over by any means finally the most desirable move is pawn g5, going after this bishop, asking the bishop to move, and then black will be able to go after the e5 pawn with pawn d5 or pawn uh, d6 or bishop g7. Many, many moves uh, will go at this pawn in a very effective way. However, this is exactly what Timon was hoping for, and he now has a brilliant resource of his own, and this is why we should you know, acknowledge his creative brilliance in the game as well. Rook takes c6, two exclamation marks. After rook takes c6, pawn takes c6, white has maybe not enough counterplay to save the game, but close to it. Knight a5 check now, 
and the king should go ahead and capture on a7. Knight takes c6 check, and if the king tries to run out, king b6 is actually going to allow black, uh, allow white an immediate draw. Bishop e3 check, bishop c5 check is the best move, queen b4 check, and now this bishop is going. But so is the white knight. King takes c6, queen takes c5, king d7, queen d5 check. And at this point, you should be a little cautious. You have to allow a perpetual. King c8, check, and check, and you should repeat, it's a draw. If you try king e7, bishop c5 is mate. So instead, black can still try to win, and I'm going to give a long computer line here. I'm not going to analyze all of the variations, but the main line goes, after the sacrifice on the, of the rook on c6, knight a5 check, king over, knight takes c6 check, the king can try to run to the king side, and he can succeed to some extent. But after all of these checks, eventually we get to this position where e6 check is a strong move, the rook takes, and now the king is bound to the defense of the rook. So the knight can try to check the king away. Ultimately, the king runs over here, and bishop e5 check is a strong move. If you step back here, actually white wins with queen f5 check, so you have to give up the rook, and after queen takes king over, uh, white is still down a piece, but the black king is exposed. White has more checks and will be able to pick up more pawns with check, and maybe black can win, but this is not as decisive as what Karpov plays in the game, and white has more objective uh, drawing chances. So there's both some practical considerations. Why would we want to allow this when we have better? Um, and objectively, this generates some significant counterplay, right? So practically, we don't want it, and objectively, we don't want it. So after rook c1, pause your videos and try and figure out, having thought about these moves that Karpov could have played, what did he actually play? After a lot of thought, um, I... Actually, I don't know how much time he, he thought on this move, but I would imagine that it took him a long time to find the correct move here. Maybe not. You know, he could be that great of a player. King a8 is played, right? And I think this is a move that you only get to after really thinking about the alternatives and figuring out why they don't work. This is the best move, even according to Stockfish, which is really surprising. Why would we take time out in this position that seems to demand energy? and is all about you know activity and development, why would we take a tempo here to play king a8? What does that really achieve for us? And this move uh, basically rules out rook takes c6 and any other source of counterplay that white you know, was trying for. After the sacrifice here, this bishop blocks, you can't take here because the queen defends, and then we've got a skewer over here. So the king is now safe on a8. And also other sources of counterplay like knight a5 fail, uh, in this case because of the nice bishop b4 check, right? And if the queen takes, no check to the king on b7 now, queen e2 is mate. And uh, if you try to run with the king, we can grab this knight. What if the king tries simply to walk away with king f2? Now, again, because there's no counterplay over here, g5 comes and it's very, very strong. And notice that the king stepped to a8. It didn't capture on a7, so there's no bishop e3 with tempo. If bishop e3 now, there is the possibility of queen to e2 check for a start. So in the game, after the winning king a8 move, um, and by the way, before I show the next move, this king a8 move, I think, demonstrates Karpov at his very best. This is a prophylactic move. Karpov was possibly the greatest chess player of all time at detecting and suppressing his opponent's you know, counterplay and tactics. This move does exactly that. Um, also, he's one of the greatest players of all time in terms of creating harmony in his pieces, and this move does it perfectly. It not only you know makes the king safe and suppresses counterplay, we'll see that it introduces the bishop before idea that we've seen, uh, also adds some coordination to this piece, and generally lets everything now flow for black. The position is in complete harmony from black's perspective after king a8. So king a8, h4 is tried, trying to supp uh, suppress the g5 move. d5 now comes, attacking the queen. The queen needs to move. Queen c2 was a possibility, but then rook takes e5. Very strong. Queen takes... 
uh, king f2, and this is a winning move. You can pause uh, the video and try to think about this position for a while, but the threats of queen takes g3 and rook f8 are too much. There are a few defenses you can try for white. I'm not going to show them, but they all fail against best play. So backing up here to uh, this d5 move, instead, Timon, Pla Timon tries queen e3, and now we get pawn g5. Boom. This move completely wins by force. Basically, the bishop is trapped. Notice the pawn can't take because the rook on h1 will be hanging. So the bishop does try to take, and now everything explodes from black's perspective. Bishop b4 check. The undeveloped bishop comes out. King f2. Rook hf8 check. The undeveloped rook comes out. All the pieces are coordinated, centralized, and contributing to an attack on the white king. King over. Another good point to pause the video if you want to try and figure out what uh, Karpov is going to play. Rook takes e5. These kind of sacrifices just naturally happen in these kinds of positions. The queen takes, queen f3 check now uh, because the queen left the f3 square. If you go back, we have mate in one, so you might as well try king over to h2, queen f2 check, and actually in this position, uh, Timon resigned. And the main idea is after the only legal move, king up, you can pause the video again if you want to find the next move, bishop c8 check. A retreating move forces checkmate after g4 and rook down to f3 check, queen blocks, and we can take. I'm going to leave it on this position though, instead of showing the final mate, because I think this particular move is the perfect final spot because this move was enabled by king a8 all the way back on move 19. And although I really don't think, as some people have suggested, that Karpov could have seen bishop a8 when he retreated the king to, uh, bishop c8 when he retreated the king to a8, it is a fitting final touch to his very, very fine king a8 move earlier, showing his pieces again in complete harmony where everything manages to find kind of the correct square. This is, I think, one of uh, Karpov's best games, uh, but we should also respect Timon for the creative ideas that he brought to the table, and we should learn from uh, the problems created by his aggressive tactical play at the cost of development and at the cost of his castling rights, right? These are mistakes that we as amateurs make all the time, and here you can see a super grandmaster, a legitimately incredible player making the same sorts of mistakes. So I hope you enjoyed this game. If you did, uh, take a moment to like the video, uh, like and follow uh, my other social media channels. And if you uh, really liked it and wanna share it, that would be the best possible thing so that other people uh, you know, could check it out as well. Thank you so much and have a great day.